Thank you very much for coming. We're really pleased to have you. Welcome to the launch of the Universities and Muslim Seminaries Project report. Um, so just to introduce myself, my name is Alia Ibieri. I'm a postdoc researcher at SOAS, which is, uh, it was the host institution of the Universities and Muslim Seminaries Project. The project was undertaken in 2019 with funding from the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. Uh, and the project was aimed at building bridges between universities and Muslim seminaries. In particular, uh, trying to understand uh, to, um, around a few main um, research trajectories. So one of those was understanding the uh, career trajectories and career choices of young alims and alimas. Um, alims and alimas, if, uh, if you're not familiar, are Islamic scholars. They're um, students of the Islamic tradition who've been trained in seminaries or other Islamic colleges and institutions. Uh, and in the UK, we have over uh, at least 26 Islamic seminaries, most of which are not accredited by mainstream universities. And what this means is that a lot of the young Islamic scholars who are graduating from these institutions don't necessarily have qualifications that align to the expectations of mainstream university sector and the job market. So although uh, they are very proficient and fluent in um, a vast, um, rigorous and erudite um, Islamic canon, uh, there are often troubles connecting the two sectors of Islamic seminaries and universities. So one of the things we looked at was um, a nationwide and currently the biggest survey about uh, is, uh, the career trajectories of Islamic young Islamic scholars. We did um, in-depth research into some of the issues around Muslim female scholars and um, their advancement in the field of Islamic teaching and Muslim community leadership. And we also organized various roundtables and connections between uh, key partner institutions. Um, and finally, we also created a toolkit for universities and Islamic seminaries, which we will hopefully share with attendees. So um, just to give you an idea what's happening in the next hour or so, um, I will be introducing a little bit um, about the project as I have. Um, we will then go on to listen to Alison Scott Bauman. Professor Alison Scott Bauman was the principal investigator of uh, the project that was undertaken at SOAS in 2019. Uh, it will be followed by Zara Mohammed, uh, who will speak a little bit about creating leadership in the Muslim community. Um, this will then be followed by Sheikh Shams Doha, um, who will then um, be followed by Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, um, and then Ustada Shanaz Begum, Mahmoud Chandia, and then we'll have some time for question and answers. So um, the report itself is currently in the final stages, and we're hoping to be able to share it with everybody who's attending today after the event. So uh, the report is not long in itself, but we have actually been able to publish an academic paper as well as the report uh, detailing um, the work that we did with universities and Muslim seminaries. And uh, as an appendix to the report, we also have a, a toolkit for universities and Muslim seminaries about how to connect and how to pursue accreditation. So um, without further ado, I would like to uh, move on to our first speaker, um, Professor Alison Scott Bowen. Um, just um, uh, a little introduction about Alison. Um, Professor Alison is Professor of Society, uh, Society and Belief at SOAS, University of London. She was the principal of investigator on the UMSEP Muslim Universities and in Universities and Muslim Seminaries project at SOAS, and she's currently leading the Influ Influencing Corridors of Power project also at SOAS. Her work has two interrelated research strands about social justice and philosophy, and she's best known for her ongoing work on Islam in Britain that dates back to 1997. Um, her most recent um, project was the AHRC funded Representing Islam on Campus, which um, now has been published as an edited volume. So I'll hand over to you now, uh, Professor Anderson. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali. It's lovely to be here. Thank you very much for joining us. This is a very special occasion for us because we've been working on this 
for some time, um, the idea of creating a permeable membrane, if you like, between mainstream universities and Muslim seminaries. And this is so, I think this is so important to the future of Britain and indeed the world, because we must surely speak to each other and communicate with each other better than we are currently allowed to do. There are some precedents for this, as you will know, and some of you are present here today, there are some good affiliations already between Muslim colleges um, and universities, but there's plenty more to do. And I just got five points to make, which will, I hope, contextualize this really important work for you. A couple of things to say before my five mini points, and that is to thank my team who are brilliant. Shams and I have worked together on and off for years, and this has been a really, really brilliant group to work with. We are joined here today by two representatives from the government. Uh, Katie Campbell from the Ministry of Community, Housing, Communities and Local Government, uh, and Colin Bloom, who is the Independent Faith Advisor to the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government. And he is conducting currently a review for the government of the government's relationship with and commitment to all faith communities. So Colin has kindly agreed to say a few words at the end, just before Shamps rounds everything off. So as well as saying thanks to the wonderful team, to contextualize this, um, I produced a report for New Labour actually in 2010. And having read that um, a, in 2019, almost 10 years later, a civil servant called Hilary Patel who worked with us very closely, came to me and asked me to set up this project, which we are launching here today with your help. She understood very clearly the necessity of acknowledging the five, six, seven years of labor, intellectual labor undertaken by many young British Muslims who then wish to segue into um, more, uh, publicly understood forms of higher education in order to enhance their professional development and to be able to play a full role in British life. So Shams and I really liked Hilary Patel's vision and we built a team of key researchers and a, a team of key national experts. We met all our targets that were agreed with the government, including the fact that several universities and several seminaries stepped up to the plate and agreed in 2020 that they would be interested in working with us to further this project. Now, as we all know, tragically and irrefutably, awfully, COVID intervened in that. So everything went into suspended animation or we had to put it on ice, whichever metaphor you want to use. So we hope we will meet with government uh, in a few weeks time after this launch and revisit all this work that we've done to see how we can revive the project. There is much still to be done. Um, Alia has mentioned the toolkit. That would be a really important instrument for uh, university admissions officers to use to see how they can map the achievements of Darlulam graduates onto national baseline. And also, I just want to highlight um, the fact, the importance of young British Muslim women's work in this, because we very much are aware of the fact that most of the seminaries are for young men and the minority is for young women. That doesn't reflect the distribution of the population, and you will be hearing more about this really important work later. So thank you very much for joining us. Lovely to be here today with you. Thank you, Alia. Uh, Professor Allison, thank you very much for the overview and history of the project. Um, I'd now like to move on to Zara Mohammed. Uh, a little bit about Zara. Um, Zara Mohammed has a master's degree in human rights law and has a background in training and development consulting. In 2016, she was elected the first female president of FOSIS, which is the Federation of Student Islamic Societies. 
And in 2020, she was elected the Secretary General, Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain, the first woman and the youngest person to hold the position. She is passionate about empowering young people and supporting women in her community. Thank you very much, Sarah, if you could take the stage. Assalamualaikum and good afternoon, everyone. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. My many thanks to the organizers and Sheikh Shams for the invitation to speak to you on such uh, an important and significant breakthrough in this area. Um, you know, I'm, as a, a young leader myself, actually, I was asked to speak about, you know, how do we develop leadership in our communities, especially young leadership. And I think part of that is really about the culture, the environment and the empowerment. And I think for anything to really grow or flourish, there has to be the right kind of oxygen and atmosphere to do that. And I think, you know, that tradition of knowledge uh, that takes place in seminaries and the young people who take a very admirable step to dedicate so many years to studying the Islamic sciences also deserve, you know, the best opportunities to share the knowledge, to share in the learning and to share in their experiences so they can continue to, to benefit you know, all communities and beyond. So I think this report and this project and initiative by you all is so important. You know, reflecting now on, you know, British Muslim communities, where we are today and what is the challenge for us in the future. I think really we're looking at what kind of future we want. And especially as young people and a younger generation, where do we want to be in that future? And I think certainly with this project, we're looking at how do we continue to inspire a culture of growth and leadership in young people, especially those young people who haven't quite been given the same opportunities in the system, yet have attained a level of discipline and skill that probably is really impressive, way beyond my own anyway. And so I think, you know, what we're really doing is creating pathways. And what I've learned so far in my leadership journey here at the MCB, and that with all of these uh, challenges, there are also lots of opportunities and the success of this project, the success of this initiative and the partnership is really critical that we all invest and contribute and provide that necessary support and encouragement that people see that actually um, whatever road they're taking, there's lots of opportunities and, and goals for them. Um, I actually have family members who have, have taken the route of the seminary studies and what I found really interesting actually was the, that this report really highlights is about the, the gender balance that lots of young females are also really keen to take, to take the step to, to dedicate, you know, several years to study and to be part of a kind of a generation and a, a culture of scholarship and change. So with the family members that I know that have taken place and I know they get to a point in the journey where they're thinking, okay, well, what will I do with all of this learning? You know, how do I take it forward? And, and, how do I contribute? What do I do with it? And, and it, I know it's quite intensive study as well, so it's not easy. And so I think what this is really about is creating opportunities and ways for them to, to, to take their learning to the next level, to be able to contribute to society that actually is hungry for change makers, trailblazers, and certainly lots of young leaders. So I think um, it's really commendable to you all to have dedicated so much time to, to this. I personally am a, a fan and supporter. Any way the MCB can help to, to support you and advocate, we'll certainly do that. But I think certainly for British Muslim communities, for the future and the change that we wanna see in our institutions, we are very much uh, uh, also welcoming the young leaders that have been developed in the seminaries. And of course, um, that will be the future of uh, our institutions and our organizations. So thank you so much for having me on here. And I know my time is short, so I don't know how long I've got left, but certainly at the MCB, you know, we're all for empowerment, gender inclusion, and making sure that those maybe that haven't gotten the, the best of opportunities, equalizing, shall we say, and providing some um, equitable opportunity for everybody. And I think as a young leader, um, I'm absolutely passionate about that cause and very excited for the change that you'll make on behalf of this report and these initiatives and I guess making a little bit of a dent in the education space um, to see what comes through. So thank you so much and, and just a very short reflection. And I look forward to the, the rest of the program, the launch of the report and of course the actual change on the ground. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Sarah, um, for your support and for your reflections. It's really very appreciated. Uh, one of the reasons that we would wanted your reflections and have this uh, diverse panel on the on the event today is because we believe very strongly that the research that we've been doing shouldn't just stay in the ivory tower. It's the kind of um, information data that we want to apply in the wider community and actually help make a change on the ground. So um, thank you for echoing that. Right, so the next speaker now will be Sheikh Shamsa Doha. Um, Sheikh Shamsa Doha is the co-founder and former director of Ibrahim College in London and an executive board member of the British Board of Scholars and Imams, as well as the founder of MawaridLifestyle.com. Sheikh Shams grew up in East London and he memorized the Holy Quran and studied the Islamic sciences at traditional Islamic seminaries in Dewsbury and Nottingham in the UK and also in Bangladesh. He also has a master's in Islamic studies from the University of London, Birkbeck. He has worked as a London-based imam, teacher, school governor, and has worked on several educational projects, including uh, this project that we're um, celebrating today, the universities and Muslim seminaries project. Okay, thanks. Um, Sheikh Shams, over to you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, uh, Sister Alia. Uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, salatu wassalam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man wala amma ba'd. Uh, first of all, as co-leader, I want to welcome everyone, uh, welcome and thank our panelists. And um, and like Alison, uh, I'd like to echo her thanks as well uh, of the team and thank Alison for her leadership, who has actually helped make this journey a lot easier for me. I've had to benefit a lot from, from Alison's experience. Uh, it, as someone in higher education and with a with a long uh, career in higher education as well. Um, I'm, of course, someone who's uh, from uh, an Islamic seminary. So this isn't, although I have a master's and I, you know, have spent some time uh, in academia, uh, I'm very much a seminary person. And therefore, uh, it, it was it was unfamiliar territory. Um, so thank you, Alison, and the team, uh, you've all been wonderful. So uh, thank you very much. Um, so moving on to uh, this, what I wanted to talk about, the challenges of curriculum development in Islamic seminaries. This obviously cannot be spoken of in five minutes, but there's a few things for those of us here from the seminary world, from, from the Darul Uloom world or the Islamic university world or whatever, whatever Tra seminary tradition, Islamic seminary tradition, uh, you 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 hail from, uh, and and by the way, yes, th there's there, there's there can be any number. Uh, there's different traditions in different places, um, as well as it has to be acknowledged. Many people who study the Islamic sciences privately, and you know, seminaries are, uh, you know, are are a form of organized Islamic education. But if you think of Islamic education in its origin, it was a very private uh, kind of teacher to student affair. And I think that needs to be acknowledged. And that also is going through something of a revival uh, at the moment. So uh, this, the reason why I was interested in this project was, was mainly because it was interested, it, this project was about me and it was about people like me and about our opportunities afterwards. And while it is true that career opportunities and postgraduate opportunities are limited uh, for seminary graduates because what they study for all of those years, a decade, you, know, you can say eight to 10 years on average, if I might put it that way, depending on, on the exact configuration of your studies, um, it is a lot of study after which to come out with no recognized qualification and then be disadvantaged, not so much in the wider workspace, but in your own sort of, in, in, in within the community, within even the employment opportunities that we have within the community, um, there is still a disadvantage if you do not have uh, a recognized uh, qualification of some sort or other. So for example, if two Imams are applying for the same job, um, and one has put in those extra years, so on top of their, their seminary studies. So they may have spent seven, eight years, 10 years in seminary, but then took that extra initiative and, and, and maybe even went as, 
or as far back as starting again from A levels and then doing an undergraduate uh, uh, degree and then a postgraduate degree, um, even if it's in Islamic studies. Um, I have a friend who did that, not quite Islamic studies, but you know, but he 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 uh, studied economics. Um, then you know, naturally, you have an advantage uh, and would be preferred for the post over the person who hasn't. When kind of both are, 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 are a bit unnecessary. This person having to go back and spend all of those extra years in higher education again is something of an unnecessary, uh, is, is something that is unnecessary. And then uh, for, for, for the other person to kind of uh, be looked over as a result of what is a, a, dis a structural disadvantage, it, it, it's not that they haven't studied. It isn't that they don't have skills. It isn't that they don't have the necessary competencies. Competencies. They just don't have the recognition. So this is an important thing that has to be addressed. Um, at the root of it is if if we are to move towards uh, solving this problem, then at the root of it is uh, is curriculum development, right? The need to to develop seminary um, syllabi and curricula to a level, um, or at least in terms of its format, uh, to develop it in a way that it can uh, attain accreditation or recognition. And by recognition, I mean, uh, for, it would be possible for say, a seminary graduate to go straight into an MA program. Uh, and we acknowledge efforts where uh, people, institutions like Markfield have offered like third year, second or third year, Kind of undergraduate progression for seminary graduates but what we would with a kind of recognition we would like to see which kind of informally exists is for seminary graduates to be able to get into postgraduate studies if they feel if they have the confidence that they can that they can study at that level um and that's that's kind of the journey i went through and many others went through but informally we, it wasn't formally recognized so we had to kind of talk our way into it given that as mature students it is technically possible and the second, uh, and I suppose the preferred position would be for there to be some form of accreditation. And that is a curriculum development challenge. And here really all I wanna say to the seminary world is uh, some words of, uh, of, of reassurance that we're not talking about structural changes to the objectives of the traditional Islamic seminary curriculum, but rather a kind of, um, uh, a reorganization of it based upon the structures of UK higher education so that uh, higher education can, can understand it and its teaching strategies and it structurally fits into the kind of teaching strategies and assessment strategies of higher education so that the same content that is taught in, uh, in Islamic seminaries at the same standard, perhaps even better, because the, the nature of curriculum development work is that it tends to raise the bar, it tends to raise the standards. The moment an institution goes through that journey, standards actually rise and improve. Um, and then- I'm and sorry, then, sorry. two minutes if that's okay. And then, then uh, to achieve accreditation, which in higher education works, it's called validation. And in higher education, basically, uh, a university provides the accreditation as opposed to say in secondary and tertiary education where it is an examination board that provides accreditation of a course uh, like an A-level or a GCSE. Here it's a university so it would there'd be a kind of um, a, a, an MOU or understanding with the university who would agree to work with the seminary to go through the journey of validation and the challenge here is really about how we present uh, what we study in seminary, rather than making significant compromises, uh, which are not necessary. And there is a fear uh, and an anxiety about this, that are we going to lose some of the key, uh, some of the key strengths of the seminary curriculum? Like, for example, the personal development, the tarbiyah, the spiritual development aspects of, of, uh, of the seminary curriculum, which is part and parcel of it. This is an aspect, perhaps, that a higher education accreditation wouldn't touch. Um, and there are, there are, structural challenges that are to do with uh to do with resources that i think just as a community um we we have we we may well have to address i mean how many seminaries have the resources for example to have a team uh working on curriculum development 
And this is where perhaps this UMSEP effort, this, this project may be open, perhaps will open the doorway to external help for, uh, for seminaries when it comes to curriculum development and when it comes to just kind of helping, helping them navigate some of the issues surrounding uh, this objective. And for that, uh, you know, us as a team, you know, we're always there to support you, support uh, the seminary community. Um, and we also hope, inshallah, that there will be a next phase to this project. And we, we're hoping that that phase may, if, if we can knock on the right doors and if the right people support us, then it may well also involve some sort of capacity within our team to be able to help and support the capacity building and the development of Islamic seminaries. That is what we hope for. And that would be very much a kind of grassroots community focused effort um, where we develop some seminary programs and curricula on their own terms. I really want to stress this, and it's extremely important. When I speak about this, I've spoken about this in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, across the world, where the kind of Dersen Nizami type uh, curricula uh, are operated. And people expect me to talk to them about incorporating science and technology and, and IT and things like that into seminaries. And when I speak to them about developing the seminary curriculum on its own terms, they kind of uh, they're taken by surprise. They're, that's not what they expect. They think that's what the, that's what everybody wants, and that's not the purpose. The purpose is to produce. And I was just yesterday listening to a talk by Mufti Taqir Uthmani on this, who in the Dersan Nizami world, as you know, is a very very prominent person, and he was talking about how the whole conversation around curriculum really is about producing better leaders, better imams, better scholars. That's what it boils down to. It isn't about changing seminaries and turning them into something else, but rather about producing better, better leaders uh, who do the same job, but better. Uh, they, they, you know, they're contextually embedded. They understand the times that they live in. They understand the context that they live in, and they're able to serve their communities better. Uh, and I think that's definitely uh, at the core of the UMSEP effort. So I hope we can take this forward. Uh, we, we uh, you know, inshallah, we pray for, uh, for tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as well as, you know, support from the community, from funders and so on. And we hope that the road is, is easy uh, and that we will get uh, support and encouragement from government, from universities as well, uh, and that all of these doors can be unlocked and opened up. And ultimately, it, 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 this is about collaboration and different different academic cultures if you like and, and conventions coming together and surely that can only be uh, a good thing uh, thank you very, thank very much. much everyone khairan. <clears throat> thank you so much for your um uh, exploration Sheikh Shams. Uh, it actually resonates a lot with my own research and if i may just say in between uh, the next speaker um Sheikh Shams, who was formerly director at ibrahim college and also Sheikh abdul hakim murad who uh, is um, direct Dean of the Cambridge Muslim College were both quite instrumental in supporting me with my own doctoral research about models of Islamic higher education in the UK and what you're saying about curriculum development on, on, the, on the terms of Muslim institutions and the Muslim community is really quite um, pivotal to this endeavour. Um, so thank you very, very much for that. Um, I'd like to now move on to um, Sheikh Abd Hakim Murad, also known as Timothy Winter. Um, just a very quick introduction for those who aren't familiar. Um, Sheikh Abdul Hakim is an Islamic scholar, researcher, writer and academic. He is the Dean of the Cambridge Muslim College. He is Aziz Foundation Professor of Islamic Studies at both Cambridge Muslim College and um, formerly Ibrahim College. Uh, also Director of Studies at Wilson College and the Sheikh Zayed Lecturer in Islamic Studies at the University of Cambridge. So over to you Sheikh Abdul Hakim. Thank you very much. And first of all, congratulations to everybody for what I think is a kind of landmark report, really. It's a, going to be a kind of point of reference for us at our little institution in Cambridge for, for some years to come, I think. And as somebody who's been at the uh, coalface of this interaction between mainstream higher education and the seminary sector, I, I do recognise um, it as a good and balanced statement of the situation and of, of ways forward. So well done. Um, my own institution, Cambridge Muslim College, might seem to be a little bit tangential in terms of 
the relevance of its lessons to the what you are basically trying to do. Uh, we're not a dull alone trying to figure out how to tweak and adapt our curriculum and infrastructure uh, in order to be eligible for uh, uh, the outside academic world to, to validate us because we're kind of a new build, as it were. Um, we created our procedures and our uh, curriculum in consultation with, with a validating body. But still, I think we've probably learned some things about what, what can be done. We're a sort of laboratory, I guess. Uh, our main uh, output has been so far our uh, unaccredited Diploma in Contextual Islamic Studies and Leadership which um, I go to the Dar al-Alums, Brailvi and Deobandi on a yearly basis and headhunt as it were. Um, the leaders of those institutions allow me to speak to their, their graduands and I talk about what it would mean to come to Cambridge for a very intensive year of, kind of reconfiguration. Uh, and we do get some extremely able young people. I have to say, um, this may offend some, that I have found the attitude in Whitehall sometimes towards Darul Ulum students to be that they're in some obscure sense sort of disabled, in need of special help. That's not been my experience at all. Um, put them in the right context and they go up like rockets. To take one example, our current Chair of Trustees, Sohera Siddiqui, uh, began as a graduate of our first cohort of students in 2009 and then worked her way up to mainstream academe. Uh, she got a PhD from University of Southern California and she's now a tenured professor of Islamic law at Georgetown University. And we've had other examples as well. Uh, so uh, don't underestimate the native capacities of that demography uh, with the, I don't know, Asian work ethic and the Dar al hard work ethic to excel. We're not just talking about remedial work here, we're talking about drawing on a, an underestimated pool of talent that can really be of, of benefit to the higher education section and to our national life. And I've seen this again and again. Now, the validation of the diploma was always a problem because it's such a strange animal and institutions looked at it and couldn't figure out what it is. Uh, in the morning, for instance, Rowan Williams might be telling them about C.S. Lewis, and then in the afternoon they go off to the hospital for their chaplaincy placement, and then we take them to the Vatican, and then they learn about 20th century Islamic thought, and it seems to be so disparate that institutions aren't quite sure what to do with it. So we've staggered on for nine years without it being accredited. Whether that really matters is something which could be contested. Because after a while, a good institution and academic product will proceed on its own reputation. So we now have a deal with SOAS whereby our good graduates from the diploma, even if they don't have a BA, will be accepted into the MA at SOAS simply because they've had such a good experience of our students. And maybe nine of our uh, Darul Ulum students have got into the mainstream academic uh, uh, system through that. And in most cases, I think they come from families where there is no previous experience of higher education. Um, our main product at the moment, however, is our BA in Islamic Studies, which is accredited and we work with the Open University. So questions for you people are, uh, how can I find a partner that has an experience of validating uh, external, perhaps unusual programs? Should I go for a very good institution that will hold up a lot more hoops for me to jump through? Or should I go for somebody, an institution that's quite low in the sort of league tables and the academic uh, uh, food chain uh, where it might be a little bit easier? Generally, I would say aim high because it's better for the students. Uh, but it is a complex process. I would say that it took us one year uh, of hard labor for three full-time professional uh, administrators to create all of the paperwork um, for the two stages of the validation with, with the Open University. It's a very useful discipline because we now have really good internal procedures, complaints procedures. Um, we have mechanisms for making sure that fire extinguishers are regularly checked and things like that. There's a lot, a lot to look at, but it is onerous and you should budget about £100,000 a year just to keep up with uh, the accredited process. It's expensive. Part of the problem we all have, as you all know, is that government as yet has not been able to provide what should be a very simple Sharia compliant student loan system. So we have lost a lot of students and we have struggled financially because Muslim community is essentially subject to a kind of official bar or, or disability. 
as a result of that. Uh, so fundraising becomes an issue, expansion becomes an issue. That's out of our hands. Uh, but yes, it's accredited by the Open University and we've completed the first full cohort. So we have graduates now. Interestingly, we find that because the emphasis, I think, if you're looking for validation, has to be on the ma'akul side of things rather than the mankul, in other words, traditional theology, philosophy, logic, those traditional seminary subjects, because they're more easily recognizable as academic by a validating body than, say, memorizing a thousand hadith. Uh, so because of the ma'akul stress, we find that of our uh, first cohort of students, two were accepted to do philosophy at UCL at master's level, one is doing philosophy at a Turkish university, two are becoming RE teachers, and <coughs> three haven't decided. Uh, none of them are going into mosques, and that's one reason why I said that we're a little bit marginal, because we're small and we're dealing with the creation of a Muslim intelligentsia, really, and the exploration of a British Muslim intellectual space, rather than creating um, personnel for mainstream religious uh, institutions uh, but validation yeah uh, very useful a good discipline the institutional validation is separate from the course validation institutional validation means that they look to see are your lecture rooms adequate um, are you accommodating your students um, in an appropriate way what are your complaints procedures um, things inclusivity issues such as uh, gender issues um, that is a useful discipline, but I suspect some Dara alums may struggle in terms of the simple infrastructure. There's a ratio between bathrooms, lecture space, numbers of students and so forth, which, which might be an issue without rebuilding from some of the Dara alum context that I have seen. <coughs> the course validation is to see whether in the eyes of Western academe broadly understood, the course product itself looks like an academic program. And there's a whole bunch of issues to do with how Muslims traditionally do scholarship that have to be addressed. But we've shown, I think, that it can be done and our students do regard our degree as being an authentic training in, in Islamic studies, but it is work in progress. Finally, we were trying to create an MA in counseling and psychotherapy uh, and that we couldn't get validated because the Open University and others said, we have no experience whatsoever of Islamic counseling and psychotherapy. We don't understand your paradigm. We can see your people are qualified with the right kinds of PhDs, but we, we're not qualified to assess it, which I guess is honest, but a disappointment. We're running the program, but it will be an unaccredited <coughs> diploma. Uh, and that may well be in the longer term, another obstacle that uh, what we're doing, trying to marry traditional Islamic curricula and concerns with the modern, utilitarian and outcome oriented world of modern British higher education, which is moving away from the humanities generally and towards STEM subject. It, it's an increasingly, shall I say, barbarous uh, philosophy that prevails in higher education now. But what we're trying to do may well be harder for them to understand. Final point in the longer term, of course, uh, the so-called woke beliefs uh, may well in future years become a larger and larger concern for validating institutions. And um, this hasn't been an issue so far, but it may be that as the cultural wars evolve, that it will become harder um, <coughs> for religious institutions generally, despite the fact that religion is still a legally protected category, um, to get over the bar and to be regarded as acceptable for validation. That's just kind of pessimistic speculation that I'd like to end with. But the, the main takeaway is that these kids are extraordinarily gifted, the boys as well as the girls. They're an underestimated national resource. The Darul Ulums by and large deliver a good product but it needs to be eased into a context where the kids can spread their wings and really get into not just Islamic studies in the mosques, but into careers in the wider society as well. So basically, uh, I'm bringing you good news, although uh, I know we've got a long way to go. Thank you so much, um, Sheikh Abdul Haki Murad. Uh, uh, as usual, your intervention is quite expansive and in-depth. Um, I really hope that you can still be on board as this work progresses. Um, we're now moving on to um, my colleague, Ustada Shahnaz Begum, who is also uh, part of the team for the Universities and Muslim Seminaries project. Uh, a little bit about 
uh, about Shahnaz. Ustada Shahnaz Begum is currently studying for a PhD in Arabic and Islamic studies at the University of Exeter with a focus on Islamic legal theory. She originally undertook her Islamic training at Ibrahim College, a Muslim seminary in London, where she completed the traditional Alamiya program. After this, she completed an MA in Islamic studies at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies. Shahnaz has also worked in public policy and strategy, delivering on agendas such as community cohesion and gender, faith equality, and faith equality uh, both at a local and national level. She continues to take an active role through various voluntary activities, as well as teaching in a community context. So um, Shahnaz will be talking about the um, women's outreach part of the project. Uh, the UMSET project had a, a subcommittee to deal with uh, female religious leaders, Islamic, uh, Islamic teachers, alimas, shaykhat, uh, as well as um, the, very, the very small but burgeoning uh, Islamic institutions for female, uh, female Islamic training. Uh, so uh, over to you, Shanaz. Uh, thank you, Alia, um, for that introduction, and thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us today. Um, so as, as Ali has mentioned, um, I'll be talking a little bit about the work of, of the female subcommittee, which um, I was only uh, just to emphasize a very small cog in, in the wheel of that of that work. And uh, a lot of, of credit goes to goes to my colleagues, um, uh, Sheikha Safiya Dorat and um, Dr. Alia Abieri as well, uh, just just to kind of emphasize that. Um, but it was definitely not an add on this this aspect of the project, the experiences of female seminary graduates and their role in wider society after graduation was a theme that permeated the entirety of this project. Uh, we recognised that it was important to capture female voices throughout our research and ensure that our recommendations spoke to their experiences as much as anyone else's. Um, and so it was with that in mind that UMSET set up a specific subcommittee made up of female scholars and academics to advance understanding and formulate specific proposals for female Muslim scholars. Um, now, the key objectives for this subcommittee uh, included establishing a working relationship with a female only seminary in London, uh, which we were able to do. Uh, and with them, we were also able to identify appropriate curriculum changes in order to place them on the path to accreditation. Our experience was that there was a lot of enthusiasm to develop curricula and move towards better outcomes for their students. Uh, for this reason, we also wanted to, wanted to ensure that the resources we developed to help seminaries gain accreditation was also open and fit for purpose for female Darul Alums, which we were also able to do through our toolkit, uh, which we'll hopefully be able to share with you um, over coming days. Um, so connecting with existing um, female community leaders was also an important aspect of this strand of our work. And so we were able to identify and interview a range of community leaders and scholars uh, and these interviews provided us with rich data that we hope will inform a future toolkit for aspiring leaders and scholars and will also hopefully help us to explore graduate and career pathways for female seminary graduates. Um, but one pathway that did begin to stand out from the outset and which the team explored in depth as a separate strand, but that was also very much related with our research into female graduate pathways was that of chaplaincy. Um, so the work of UMSEP's female subcommittee shows um, that there is great interest amongst uh, young Muslim women in training to become chaplains. Uh, they see chaplaincy as valuable both within and beyond their communities. Now, UMSEP undertook interviews with existing Muslim chaplains across different sectors to understand this pathway better. Many of these highlighted that there is greater need for female chaplains uh, due to current shortages of female graduates employed in this role. For example, on university campuses, over 60% of university chaplains are Christian and 9.2% are Muslim. Now, while this figure mirrors the percentage of Muslim students on campus, most of those Muslim chaplains are male, whereas more than half of Muslim students are female. These interviews also emphasize that while uh, Muslim seminary uh, graduates have the theological training to deal with contemporary issues that they may face as a chaplain, they still require training in pastoral care and communication, as well as mentoring opportunities to take on the chaplaincy role competently. Uh, the UMSEP team are confident that the next phase of this project will address these shortcomings at both graduate, undergraduate and, and postgraduate level, 
uh, and make a significant improvement to Muslim theological education um, at three different levels. Uh, so incorporating chaplaincy into new accredited courses will open new doors to develop programs that will facilitate other relevant vocations, such as counselling and teaching, uh, firstly. And uh, secondly, training Muslim seminary graduates in chaplaincy will provide them transferable soft skills, which they can use in other careers. Uh, and, and finally, introducing chaplaincy courses into uh, Muslim seminary training programs uh, will provide graduates the pastoral counselling and soft skills that are urgently needed and requested by Muslim communities. Now, a pilot chaplaincy course modelled around servant-based spiritual leadership, which emphasises humility, was also offered to a group of 18 male and female undergraduates um, and graduates from Ibrahim College uh, during the 2018-19 academic year. Uh, this pilot course was highly successful and provides a practical example of how chaplaincy training can be offered as a module within existing uh, curriculum frameworks. Furthermore, it also highlights a greater need for female Muslim healthcare chaplains and the urgent need for female role models. Um, our work on graduate pathways has also, also shown the importance of chaplaincy as a highly uh, viable career prospect for female graduates who are enthusiastic, as I said, about such roles within the health and social care sector. Uh, developing chaplaincy as a viable and established professional route to increase the potential for female seminary graduates to work across health and social care settings in England uh, and across the UK is a vital and important way of enhancing female, female leadership roles in wider society. Uh, so the work of the subcommittee looking at both the challenges and outcomes for female seminary graduates and the possibility of chaplaincy as a viable career prospect, particularly for women, uh, for female graduates, was extremely fruitful. Um, but this work is just, just really at the beginning and it provides a good foundation, but really the next phase of this, of this project is key if we want to continue going forward and see further results uh, on the ground. Uh, and hopefully you'll get to, to kind of read a little bit more about this uh, in the report that you'll be receiving. But um, hopefully that's given you a bit of a snapshot of, of, of the work of the female subcommittee. Thank you. I'll hand so... back over to you, Alia. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ustada Shahnaz. Um, you've really outlined uh, with uh, a lot of depth and rigor the kind of work that we were doing. Um, and um, yeah, now it's time to move on to our final guest speaker, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Chandia. And just to introduce Dr. Mahmoud, uh, one moment. So. Dr. Mahmoud Chandia has a PhD in Middle Eastern Studies from the University of Manchester. Uh, he is now at UCLan, the University of Central Lancashire, and he's held positions as a senior lecturer in and program leader for Islamic Studies. He is now program lead for the MA in Intercultural Business Communication and the Humanities Foundation Studies Programme, as well as senior lecturer in Religion, Culture and Society. He is also an associate member of the UCLan Cybercrime Research Unit. He lectures on a variety of humanities and social science disciplines. He's also a fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Uh, so uh, over to you, Dr. Mahmoud. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Alhamdulillahi wa ahdahu wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiyya ba'da. Amma ba'd fa'awuzu billahi min ash-shaytani wa rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim fa'atabiru ya uri al-absar. Sadaqallahu al-mawlana al-azim. Uh, good evening to everybody, and thank you for extending this invite uh, to me as well. It's very kind of you. I feel very privileged and honoured. Um, I welcome the comments so far from my co-panelists, and some very important and significant, may I add, points have been made on different aspects. Um, perhaps I should also put on record uh, that um, uh, listening about the work of the Cambridge Muslim College and visiting the Cambridge Muslim College is a different experience and I would uh, certainly encourage people to go and view uh, the great work that is happening there, as well as the Cardiff University and the Islamic uh, Foundation. Uh, I would like to just mention a few points uh, regarding uh, Darul Ulum graduates and the work that has been happening in the northwest of England. Um, as has already been introduced, I, have, I am based at the University of Central Lancashire in Preston, when, which may not be classified as the Paris of the Northwest. Uh, nevertheless, it's uh, quite a strategic location uh, because it is very near to uh, three important Darul Ulooms, and that is Darul Ulum Berry, 
in Darul Ulum Blackburn and Darul Ulum Bolton. And of course, in these very same towns, we have some part-time routes that offer Darsini's army um, that are being taught as well, where uh, university attending students attend in the evening to study the Darsini's army. My experiences over the last 20 years, uh, I have uh, noticed and taught many Darulum students coming into higher education. They've started off uh, enrolling at what we facilitated at UCLan, which is the acronym for University of Central Lancashire, on Islamic studies programs. And then eventually they branched out into social science degrees. Um, and I'm sure Professor uh, Abdul Hakim Murad will uh, uh, support me in saying the importance of social science in the legacy of uh, our Islamic uh, heritage. Now, then there was um, a, a movement, a phase, where the students were coming from Darul Ulooms, Berry or Blackburn or Bolton, but were not taking up the opportunity of having their learning compensated and having an informal accreditation. Rather, they were entering into different disciplines, whether that be social science or non-social science based. Um, so, and so from about 2000 to 2010, the first decade, we saw a very great focus on Islamic studies or religious studies, um, which then developed into religion, culture and society. Then there was a phase of moving into sort of non uh, religious or theological studies. At the moment at UCLan, what we have offering, offered from September 2021 is that any Darulum student who will successfully complete a bridging program um, will be able to enter directly onto a postgraduate program, directly onto the MA in Religion, Culture and Society. Um, some students have already uh, taken up the opportunity to have an informal interview and will be enrolling on the bridging program and will be given a, a, a direct route onto the MA program, uh, which I do believe is substantial pro uh, progress um, because I have personal experience of trying to accredit Darlan program since the 1990s. So over the last 30 years, and I'm sure the previous report of, I think it was called Muslim Faith Leadership Training, by Professor Alison Scott Bowman, and the current one, which I also commend, uh, will testify this is a significant development uh, in this phase. Um, I have also seen many Darulum students, and, and we have to realize Darulum dynamics are changing. We have in places young leadership, we have ulama whose children have become uh, an alim now, and who are realizing there is a text v context dynamics that needs to be uh, balanced out. So the Darul Ulooms, I think, are major players. Um, they have equally a lot to offer to British higher education. Uh, and one of the lessons perhaps uh, they would need to learn is how education is talked about within universities and the uh, transferable skills that need to be developed uh, within university uh, graduates. I was very pleased to note all of the speakers were at the heart of their conversations were talking very favorably, in fact, about Darulum graduates and the skills that they have. It's unlocked raw potential that needs to be uh, let loose on society. Equally, there is perhaps a dearth of opportunities within Darul Ulooms for them to teach perhaps the higher texts that they were uh, going through themselves and perhaps a dearth of opportunities within a masjid or, or, a, or a mosque or any academy to for them to engage. So my experience is indicating a lot of them are accepting the notion of social mobility uh, via education and seizing the opportunities of perhaps three or four or five extra years of learning and the world is their oyster um, after this. And some have even uh, decided to migrate to places like North America, where there is perhaps a greater appreciation of um, the, the efforts um, that they, they, have, uh, they have done. So um, I think there is a lot of core learning to be done uh, by the um, uh, British higher education system. 
and for Darul Ulooms as well. It's important to have people in the middle who would be able to facilitate and understand um, the challenges that both um, uh, institutes face. I mean, I, I personally know it, it can be difficult to uh, explain to admission officers uh, the learning that Darulum students have done um, within a context of higher education when we're talking about learning outcomes and transferable skills development, etc. So I think this would be perhaps an important conversation to be had uh, from both. I think there is an appetite and um, I've known students from Darul Uloom go from their Alimiya uh, graduation straight on to moving on to um, artificial intelligence, data science, uh, and a whole host of non-theological related uh, sciences. So I think this is an, a very important development. Perhaps if, if, if I may use the most famous words, one important step for mankind uh, in this relationship between, at the heart of it, two learning centers, which equally has a lot to offer to each other. And I think as equal players, um, there is, I think, good progress to be made. And um, maybe the Darul Ulooms can learn a few lessons about how the whole conversation around uh, enrichment and enhancing the curriculum um, and um, adding value to the learning experience um, of the students. Uh, likewise, perhaps for higher education, it's how do Darul Ulum um, uh, uh, how are they able to instill this uh, notion of applied study and rigorous study? Uh, because I, I'm sure university lecturers will tell you so they struggle sometimes to get university students to read books. Um, so there is a skill there as well within the Arlum students alongside many others. Um, I have been indicated that I, I should be uh, summarizing uh, my points. So I, I will once again, uh, commend the efforts of Professor uh, Alison Scott Bowman and her team and uh, the other efforts that are happening across the UK, whether that's at Islamic Foundation or Cardiff or at the Cambridge Muslim College. I think there are good opportunities for mutual conversations uh, at a peer-to-peer -peer level and I'm, I'm sure um, there will be very interesting developments uh, in the future. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Mahmoud Chandia. Um, you've really enriched our uh, panel discussion today. I really appreciate your insights, particularly um, as a Northerner, uh, to have the Northern representation there as well. Um, so we've uh, come to the uh, end of our guest speaker interventions today. And we've also come to the end of the official timing of the event. We are a little bit over time. Um, However, I would just like to ask participants if you are able to stay on for another 10 to 15 minutes that we will take question and answers shortly. Um, if however you need to go, that's, uh, that's fine. We've just had quite a lot to squeeze into um, today's session. Um, some of you will already have seen that the link to the report has been placed in the chat. If you can't see it, that's not a problem because we will be emailing all attendees the uh, link to the report and also um, the link to the academic journal article, which we wrote based upon the project. Um, just before we go on to question and answers, because I know some people might, might need to leave, I would really like to thank our key partners and our task force for helping us and supporting us all the way through this project. Um, firstly, our key partners in the project, where we were trying to build bridges between institutions. Um, wow. On the side of the Muslim seminaries, we had a Sufa Institute uh, at in Birmingham, which is an unconventional seminary, but um, uh, nonetheless based upon some of the um, same curricula. Nur al-Islam, a women's seminary in London, and Mahdi Institute, a Shia seminary in Birmingham, and Ibrahim College also of London. And for the university partners, we had Birmingham University, St. Mary's University of Twickenham, and Leeds University. And we're extremely grateful to all the partners for um, participating in our bridge building, in our um, round tables and the curriculum mapping exercise that we did together. Um, there's also a little list of um, 
the representative organisations that were involved in our consultative task force. Again, we're, we're very grateful. The list of names is too long, so unfortunately we couldn't name everybody individually, but um, the gratitude is uh, nonetheless for that. So um, I would now like to go on to um, question and answer. I know that there's uh, quite Alia, a lot- Alia, yeah? can, I, can I just interrupt you for a second? Given that we're running over, could you, would you like to, as chair, just like to check with Mr. Colin Bloom, that he's able to stay on for a few minutes? Yes, absolutely. If not, um, not perhaps he could speak now. Yes, um, Mr. Colin Bloom is the independent faith advisor for the um, for the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. And um, he's very kindly offered to um, just give a perspective uh, at the end of the event. So would you like to go now? Please, if yeah. I can. I'm sorry, I, I have another yeah. appointment that I've got to get to. But thank you so much for the um, um, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm having to do this on my iPhone because the government computer here doesn't allow me to do Zoom for some bizarre reason. But um, um, in any event, I I, I really um, found today's um, uh, uh, meeting you know, really really interesting, very helpful, and and I and I really welcome the contribution that um, that the report has made. I've had a I've had a quick read of it. Um, I think it's a really valuable conversation to, to have in seeking to find ways of accrediting faith-based higher education institutions. And I think that as one of your speakers said, there is a journey of accreditation and validation that needs to happen. And, um, and I think that's, uh, it feels like you're, um, you know, you're well on the way to, to making some, some, some very real progress. I think also as, um, Sheikh Shams Mohammed so helpfully suggested that there could be a almost like a team approach, you know, with the community, with donors, with universities, and with government to to sort of help build capacity, sort of um, in this effort, and 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 really sort of embed that capacity into the into the process. So I think that's that's very welcome. Um, as uh, uh, as uh, Professor Allison said, my, um, I'm publishing a review that's coming out later this year, a report that's coming out later this year. Um, and that report really has three major sections to it. The first is, really asks the question, is faith good for society? It might seem like a really stupid question to ask, but is faith good for society? And, and actually, you'd be surprised very few uh, how, how, how rarely that question is asked. So I'm seeking to answer that. And um, I don't think anyone on this uh, on this call would be surprised that the answer is yes. Faith is overwhelmingly good for society and makes an overwhelmingly positive contribution to society, both in civil and in civic life. Um, um, and so the second part really sort of leads on from that, which is well, in which case, how can government do better, um, and what can government do to engage better with faith communities? And then the third the section really looks at the challenges that exist within faith practice and that's something that we're um that that, uh, that, that we're looking at um you'll be pleased to know that I, I will be covering um chaplaincy uh including the pastoral care and counseling uh whether it's in prisons or on uh, uh, uh higher education campuses and um as you know, I found that the, the, the comments really, really helpful of uh, um, Shahanez uh, the, from the female subcommittee. I thought that was a really excellent contribution and I, I, I've made lots of notes on that. So I'm grateful for that. I'm, I'm sure that section on chaplaincy is going to get an honourable mention in my, uh, in my report. So look, anyway, look, thank you for the invitation to be with you. It's been, a, as I say, a really valuable conversation. And um, I guess let me finish by just saying JZK. Thank you very much, Mr. Colin Bloom. Um, and for those who don't know, Jason K is Jazad Club here. Thank you um, in the Islamic greeting. Um, thank you very much for, for adding your reflections. And we'll now promptly go on to question and answers because we've got actually quite a lot of Q&A. Uh, I'd like to start, if it's okay, with Professor Mohammed Hamza Halim of SOAS, um, who uh, is of the host institution for this project. Um, Professor Abdul Halim, I know that you um, have your hand up, so I'm going to allow you to talk. Um, are you able to talk now? You need Thank to unmute you yourself. I've come to this meeting and I support the project very much. I should feel actually proud of myself for having been able on my own initiative over the last seven or eight years 
who gain admission to a number of seminary graduates into the MA Islamic Studies at Seoul. It wasn't easy, but we have done it. Because you see, these institutions are not recognized institutions. So the registry was automatically would say, no, we will have nothing to do with these people. I had to do it gradually by first asking some of these uh, graduates to go and, gay and get one year diploma of the Muslim college. And then suggested that we could have take one or two of them and try and see how it will work. It worked very well indeed. After two or three years, I said, anybody who objected to what I was doing in the registry, I said to them, look at the exam results of the MA Islamic Studies and see for yourself. Many of these people have done very well indeed. Some of them now actually are brighter and more able than normal university students who have been admitted in the normal way. So you have to, you see, I had to change the culture, even my own culture. I am committed to the British system of education and would not be seen to dilute it. So we have to do things to enable these people to be accepted in the system. And this has been done. I think that these people in Dar al Uloom and so on, they, they are there. Muslim parents are there who wanted their students or their children to have religious education. But it really is, sometimes I would see it as a terrible thing to let a child to go into a system of education where they won't be admitted to higher education and won't have normal jobs and so on. They have to do something, develop their curriculum, develop their curriculum. I can sit and talk to anyone who is interested in this in order to get more of them able to admit it. And in a, within, a, within a while, the universities yeah. as a whole will yeah. see that these are valid I mean, uh, institutions and allow their students to come into the university. As I said, I think we have done very well in the Center of Islamic Studies at Suez, and we had good number of these people. I mean, for some reason, more women students than men do better. We have this year, we have actually one who is from a seminary in America, not here. And she is fantastic. So why should someone like this not be enabled? And you know, many of them have already gone to do PhDs mm -hmm. and worked as, that is, we should, we should, they should be enabled mm -hmm. to develop their own curriculum. Uh, Professor Thank you so much. You've you've actually hit on something a really important part of the motivation for this project, and um, I'm really grateful you've been able to come and and tell us your perspective because you've been really instrumental in um, giving a step up and enabling a lot of the Darul Uloom and Islamic Seminary graduates to gain further postgraduate degrees at SOAS. Um, for those of you who don't know, Professor Abdul Halim is like a godfather of Islamic studies in the UK yeah. universities. Um, he's a very He's a world famous uh, translator of the Quran into English. Um, and we're very grateful to have his support and also just his, um, his vision for um, bridging Islamic studies in mainstream British universities and in um, the traditional and uh, devotional institutions. Um, so thank you so much, Professor Abdul Halim. Um, we've got quite a lot of questions, so I'm gonna move on to some of the written questions. Um, I have a question from Mr. Ismail N. Ismail. Um, Speaking as a student of both part-time seminary and as a postgraduate student in, the, in a UK university, may I please ask why the focus is on restructuring or reconfiguring the centuries-old structure as opposed to leaving it as it is and instead working alongside Western academia to accept and recognise seminary education for what it is? So um, that's a really pertinent question and um, I, I'd like to... Um, Point it to Sheikh Shams. Are you, are you able to uh, answer that one, please, briefly, if you can? Uh, thank you uh, for that. Um, the I think we we can't in in direct to respond to that question directly. We can't escape 
the the realities on the ground, which are that seminary graduates are not uh, they they do not have what well, two things. Number one, they're not coming out with uh, some of the wider skills that are required in order for them to be better ulama. And that's a simple question of not so much just curriculum development in order to receive accreditation, but more just a question of development in seminaries. And and a lot of positive things have been said about our seminaries, and they're doing a fantastic job given their overall context. But in terms of seminaries working contextually within the, based upon what the needs of the society are, it's possible to say that seminaries in India, in places like India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh are actually more connected to their context because there is no there is no way that they cannot be. Whereas in the UK, with no link to higher education, as well as to the employment sector, there is something of a disconnect. And that reality cannot just be ignored because seminaries do not exist in a vacuum. They never have done. And the idea that, you know, they're centuries old and are unchanged is, you know, that idea is there, but it's, it's not true that they are unchanged, but rather they always go through uh, development and also, uh, the, the, if you want, if we want to see evidence of that, then we simply have to look at the fact that seminaries in different parts of parts of the world have different curricula, they have different nisabah, they have different syllabi, because they have different contexts. Seminaries across the ages have had different emphases. Uh, I like I, I I'm going to keep referencing this talk I listened to, and I'll I'll actually share this somehow, um, perhaps on Facebook or something like that. Mutaka Uthmani kind of impromptu addresses all of this, and he talks about. He mentions a talk yesterday and he talks about how the curriculum needs to be adapted based upon the way things have changed. And he particularly used the example of uh, of a kind of uh, classical uh, logic and philosophy and uh, and theological references in the Islamic and curriculum as it was yesterday, sort of in his time. And then and, and, and the need for or rather he was saying that and we're changing it now to incorporate contemporary philosophy. That is a change that would have been unthought of, right? Would, would have been unthinkable, you know, um, 10, even 20 years ago. So I think it's inevitable that that will happen. And the second thing I was going to say is, uh, is referencing it back to what I said before, that, that curriculum development does not mean we change the core objectives of our seminaries, but rather things can be done given and I can tell you from experience because I've gone through this a couple of times now things can be done in a way where uh, the core values and the core priorities um, of the seminary curriculum can be retained with with some uh, with some changes in order to make them more compatible with UK higher education and I wouldn't be involved in this effort if I didn't think that was possible. Yeah, thank you very much, Sheikh. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I was just going to say that the um, the reference that you gave to Mufti Taki Uthmani's um, talk, we can hopefully share it with all the attendees because we'll be sending everyone a follow up email. Um, I think that would be really useful. Yeah. Also, we actually have a lot of very pertinent, very um, juicy, interesting questions, and we won't be able to cover them all because we're over time. So I'm going to select one question for each panelist. And then hopefully, if the panelists are able to support with this, we'd like to answer all the questions in writing and um, send them out to the attendees after the event because a lot of them are very very useful interesting questions um i've got one a next question uh, for professor allison scott bauman um if you don't mind this is from sheikh muhammad buta and um the sheikh asks firstly to what extent do you think this report impacting to what extent do you see this report impacting on bridging the two worlds of islamic seminary and secular universities has there been any positive talks uh, regarding further uh, or future um, collaboration between universities and seminaries. And secondly, if this, if you can very briefly say, what are your thoughts on current bridging programs, such as the Warwick University um, uh, MA, um, MA in Islamic education, sort of bridging the uh, seminary and university qualifications? Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll try and be brief. Um, Sheikh Mohammed, that's a brilliant question. I could talk about this for days. Um, but very briefly, I would say that I do think that this work has shown that there is eagerness 
we were able to work, obviously this is pre-COVID, so as I mentioned, we have to revive all these connections with a mask on probably. Um, we had very, very, we worked very well with St. Mary's Roman Catholic University in Twickenham. They, felt, they found a very strong resonance with our work because they are working constantly at that cusp, the cusp between the theological and the secular, if you like, although that's, I know that's a very crude division. We also um, have had very good conversations and seminars and workshops with Birmingham University. Um, and the, our colleagues at Leeds have been amazing. So those are just three highlights. Remember this, well, you don't know this, we didn't tell you this. This project had to be completed within six months. This is just the way it was. That was government, what government needed. We did it brilliantly, but that did mean that it was very intense. Within those five to six months, we could only focus on a, a small number of institutions. So there's plenty of partnership there. We had fantastic workshops together, bringing the two types of institution together. Your other question about bridging, very briefly, I think these bridging programs are fantastic. There's also one at Birmingham University working with Al Mahdi College. And these are, whether you call them bridging or whether you call them hybrid or blended, they are a fantastic way of bringing students and staff together who might otherwise not meet and might other, otherwise not compare their different worldviews, different and similar worldviews. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Alison Scott Bowman. Um, I have another question, um, if possible, for Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, um, Professor Timothy Winter. Um, uh, this is from an anonymous questioner. Aren't we really talking about two different epistemes? And do we really need to think about whether universities or the secular world are willing to entertain them? Well, it, it's a conversation that has to happen since we live in uh, one world and, and one country. Uh, I think it helps to remember that in the British context, uh, even state-funded universities have historically been hospitable, not just to religion as religious studies, but to religion as theology. And for legacy reasons, that's always been Christian theology. So in a sense, one way of looking at this whole question is whether the academy, which tends to assume that theology is slowly dying away, is prepared to extend that exception, which, as it were, implicitly privileges, privileges insider uh, discourse to non-Christian religions as well. Uh, and I think that's a question that a lot of universities are kind of struggling with at the moment. But it, it certainly is uh, an injustice and a structural inequality that if you come to the University of Cambridge, for instance, you can study Christianity as a Christian with people who share your faith perspective and are helping you to explore it as an insider. But you cannot do the same thing if you belong to any other world religion. Uh, that's a structural inequality that I think is at the heart of, of, of this debate and I think needs to be pushed back against. Thank you very much for that, Sheikh Abdelhakim. Um, I've got, now got a question from uh, Yahya Burt, uh, and if I can direct that to Ustada Shahnaz Begum, um, if that's okay with you. Um, and Yahya is saying thank you for this important report and intervention. May it be blessed with divine acceptance. I mean. While it is right that seminary graduates need to have their qualifications recognized, uh, thereby open up new career opportunities for them, what can be done to ensure that at the adequate training for the challenges facing the imams in 21st century Britain, and I assume you know, imamic means uh, Islamic teachers and leaders generally in 21st century Britain, in terms of intellectual, pastoral, professional skills will be sustained or developed. So what can be done to ensure that adequate training for these challenges um, will be sustained and developed? After all, integration of Islamic seminaries must still serve the goal of providing the next generation of Islamic religious leaders who can serve their communities. Um, Ustada Shahnaz, do you have any reflection? Um, I'll just give a, give a brief one. I'm, I'm probably not the, not the most qualified in this panel to, to answer that question, but thank you, Yahya, for, the, for, for that very pertinent question. Um, I think we, we, we sort of envis envisaged in this project a, a, a really holistic approach um, uh, to, uh, to, to kind of developing Darwin norms in this direction. Um, so, so kind of getting accreditation wasn't um, at the expense of, um, you know, kind of understanding why the community needs and how to train up. Uh, Darul Ulum graduates um, for that purpose. Um, so as, as kind of Sheikh Shams has already mentioned, um, you know, it's not about forgetting what the, the, the overall objective of Darul Ulum education is and, and what we hope to get out 
uh, from Darulun graduates um, in, in terms of the benefit and the impact on the ground and for the wider community. So we definitely envisaged a holistic approach to this um, and accreditation was one aspect of it. Uh, but as I mentioned in, 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 in my kind of session, um, you know, the, the sort of importance of things like chaplaincy and counselling uh, as viable uh, career options and as part of the training package of um, a Darul Ulum graduate um, was an important way to address some of these um, some of these needs on the ground and that kind of wider role that um, a Darul Ulum graduate can play. So, um, you know, I think it is it's, it's a big question, um, and you know, we we definitely would like to explore that. Um, going forward, but I hope that kind of has touched a, a little bit on, on, on your question. Thank you so much, Stella Shanaz. Uh, I'm going to direct the next question to um, Dr. Sheikh Mahmoud Chandia, and then we've got one spoken question from um, Professor Sophie Gideot Ray of Cardiff University, um, and then perhaps there might be time for one more question, and then we're going to have to wrap up for the evening. Um, so the question for Dr. Mahmoud Chandia is from Ismail Nahuda. Uh, in your time at Darnalooms, what developments have you seen? And in your time at universities in the Northwest, what developments have you seen in Darnaloom graduates? Um, wow, what a loaded question. I, I, I go back to something that Professor Alison Scott Bauman said uh, for the question that would ask. I think engaging with higher education institutes is a natural step for Darul Ulooms because most of them offer GCSE uh, programs. Some of them offer A-levels uh, in different subjects. So it's a natural phase of development. This is why there has been a success uh, for this project of some Darul Ulooms, and I'm sure they have just taken a geographic uh, selective process of who to engage at the moment with, and there'll be perhaps other Darulums who may wish to come on board. So it's a natural point of development in, in Darul Ulum cycles. Uh, secondly, I have noticed within Darul Ulums uh, at different levels in different uh, Darul Ulums, a more informed awareness of globalization, pluralism, um, the, the need to apply text to context, the, the, the need to develop um, ulama and leaders who may not all be going uh, into being imams that can serve the community in different capac capacities with a, a critical awareness of society. Okay. So there is this realization that how to get there that has been a struggle sometimes for Darul Ulooms and some have been more successful um, than others. As far as university development, well, uh, there are some universities that of course champion the cause of wider access. And because of the constituency of communities um, around those universities. Um, and the Northwest is, 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 is a, a good example of this. Um, the opportunities that the higher education programs, whether that's been in Islamic studies, theology, religious studies, or uh, social science programs, or STEM subjects, um, have been seized upon by Darul Ulum graduates. They have developed in confidence. They have developed in their um, uh, identity. Uh, they have uh, been uh, acquired a lot of uh, transferable skills. And some of them, alongside whatever profession they have uh, decided to undertake, are also providing uh, gratis and free services to some of the Darul Ulooms or some of the mosques, etc. cetera. Um, so I do feel it's a natural development and Darul Ulooms may well consider this. Uh, it's important to keep the Darul Ulooms on board within the conversation and Darul Ulooms, as uh, uh, Sheikh Shamsul Duha said, um, as we begin to talk, we'll perhaps develop a more deeper relationship and understand each other better. But I think the alum need to be core players and um, not, uh, the alums also need to understand it. There is no imposition of thought here, nor is there imposition of a change to curriculum. 
uh, there is an acknowledgement. A lot of Darulam students are taking up the opportunities to enroll on university programs in their different locations. And this is one way perhaps to help them. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Chandia, for addressing that. Um, we're going to take one um, spoken question from Professor Sophie Gilliot Ray. Uh, I think I've enabled you now to speak, um, Professor Sophie. All right. Uh Thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, greetings, uh, everyone, and, and many congratulations on this uh, important work you've been doing, which I see is really building on uh, the, the work we've been doing in Cardiff on uh, imam training, Muslim chaplaincy, and, and so on. Um, my, I've just got a, a, a sort of a nagging worry about what I'm seeing happening um, in the university sector post-COVID. And I'm hoping that this isn't necessarily happening in other universities, but at the moment we're, we're having lots of meetings in Cardiff about how we're going to deliver our programmes uh, next academic year and in the years afterwards. And I'm hearing more and more talk about blended learning and online delivery, which would cut right across the spirit of embodied learning that is so important within the traditional Islamic uh, seminary uh, world, as Sheikh Shams was was mentioning, you know the idea that that the the pupil learns at the at the feet <laughs> of their teacher, and that that you know this idea of emulating your teachers by copying their manners, their adab. So I'm really worried about a potential pedagogical divide if the universities kind of move much more towards online and blended learning. Um, uh, and what happens to that traditional mode of learning. Um, Alison, did you want to ask this question or? Alison, you had your hand up. I could reply to that if you wish. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sophie, it's lovely to hear your voice. Um, I think you're absolutely right. There are huge risks and we're blundering into um, a space that none of us understand the consequences of. You're absolutely right. But I have to say that one of the things that came out of this project, which I hope will hearten you, is that because of the some of the young women we were working with uh, wished to be quite private and quite protected in their study mode, it seemed actually to be for them quite liberating to be able to work online. So you're absolutely right. I agree with you completely about all this stuff about blended, guided, all these terms. The minute we get, we're drowning in terms which um, one becomes very suspicious of, I completely agree. But I think that that is a really positive aspect of our work that at least for the next three to five years, while we're achieving some kind of bridging towards a new understanding of higher education in a properly coherent manner, which includes um, Muslim students in this way, I think it's actually quite liberating for certainly for the young women to have this option of, of working online. So thank you, it's a brilliant question. Interesting, Interesting. thank you. Thank you, Professor Allison. Um, and if I can add just very briefly, actually pedagogy in Islamic higher education was one of the key uh, issues of my own doctoral research. And um, pedagogy has always adapted itself throughout the history of Islamic education, depending on time and context and political situation. And I, I called it um, pedagogical hybridity in the British context because some of the new institutions are keeping a lot of um, the traditional valued methods of teaching and learning and also adapting using a lot of modern and um, uh, commonplace Western pedagogical methods. Um, and I would be delighted to speak to you about that in more detail in the future. Unfortunately, now we have to close the event. It's come to seven o'clock. Um, I'm really so um, honoured that all the panellists uh, have been able to join us. It's been a fantastic discussion. I'm really pleased and delighted that um, we had so many interested and engaged attendees. We had up to, uh, I think, uh, about 130 attendees um, uh, in the event. And um, I'd like to just thank you all very, very much for giving your uh, Tuesday evening uh, to discuss these issues. Um, we, we're really heartened by uh, the investment and the excitement and the interest in uh, what we've been doing. And we really hope that 
even though this was a pilot project, that in the future we can build on it. Uh, please do stay in touch. We will uh, be emailing all the attendees afterwards with uh, the report, with an executive summary, with the academic paper that we wrote based on the project. Um, uh, also the resource, the re any resources, for example, Sheikh Shams mentioned, um, and any outstanding questions. There were some absolutely fascinating questions um, that were shared that unfortunately we couldn't cover. Um, we've had attendees from all over the world. There was questions from Trinidad and Tobago, from Sri Lanka, a question related to Islamic education in Qom, Iran, um, and I'm sure there's various other locations that people haven't mentioned um, so uh, on that note I would like to close um, uh, I think Professor Allison if you would uh, be able to just um, end the event please I'd well I'd love to ask Shams to do that but I just wanted to say thank you so much for chairing so excellently um, Alia that was lovely I think we are intending to capture all these questions uh, electronically and answer them so we can respond we will respond in text form and I apologize along with Alia for the fact that we run out of time but it was a very 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 interesting session and I would think it would be appropriate for Sheikh Shams to to bow us out thank you uh, thank you Alison um, so time right time's been a bit of a challenge hasn't it throughout um we only had six months as Alison mentioned so I think everything that we've said should be understood in context of that especially things like which data loans uh we were able to en engage with you know uh mainly it was Blackburn, Asufa, Nur Islam and so on it that was a combination of just convenience and whoever or seemed to had all I was I was already kind of uh, was interested and we knew of them through our networks that they they would be interested in something like this and I suppose what's important is is for us to proceed on to a, a next phase where we can engage other dialogues and that's what we're hoping for that we ask everybody to support us with their prayers uh, and to think about this more and more um, we will uh, as Alison has said I'm glad this came up we'll try and answer all of these questions because I think they're extremely important um, so please you know just just look out for for posts and things like that i don't know i'll i'll share um on my social media uh and hopefully at some point we can come up with some sort of online presence for umset as well which we will share with everyone um so let's see how all of that goes uh thank you very much once again thank you to the team and to the panelists um this has been fantastic although brief uh and you know we hope that this continues uh until we we get to some sort of actual result on the ground in terms of in terms of uh, uh results for our seminaries inshallah thank you very very much um sheikh shams i'm i'm uh, really torn that there were so many um interesting and useful questions that we couldn't cover uh, hopefully we'll be in touch with all attendees some of them um had questions and they've gone now um, but thank you again for everyone who's attending and um, we look forward to being in touch with you about any next steps that we hope to take and hopefully you'll be able to read the report and give us some feedback as well. Okay, thank you very much. Jazakum khair. Thank you for attending and good evening. Assalamu alaikum.